Sorry. Mark Swain. He has uh, graced us from coming all the way down from Banipal. He's a lifelong amateur astronomer like me. We have a lot in common, as I've read about his uh, biography. Um, in fact, I, I listened to his talk a few years ago at, at, up at SLAS, and a lot, of, a lot of things in common that we have, shared interests and so forth. Um, and I'm sure you'll get to know him very well by the time he's concluded with his talk, so I won't, I won't bother you with any more details about his life. But we're really grateful to have Mark here tonight, so I'll turn the time over to him. Thank you, Richard. Thank Richard for uh, giving me the privilege to come talk with you tonight. It, it is a lifelong passion, the cosmos is for me. And every time I get an opportunity to talk with people about it, I get really excited. I'd like to uh, thank Dr. Jensen here for uh, being here early and, and helping us out and do with all the technology. So you people that are uh, on the live stream right now, you can thank him for putting that all together and uh, making all the technology work. So. There's, I'm going to cover a lot of stuff tonight, and if you have questions, um, I'm going to try to save a little time afterwards, or I'll be happy to talk with you after. But uh, I don't really want to get sidetracked with a whole lot of questions during the presentation. You know, a, a word here or there is fine, but not going off on too much of a narrative. If you want to talk about anything after, I'd be happy to do that with you, even if we have to talk outside of the pond or something. Uh, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. See, is the first slide up there? There we go. I'd like to start my presentation tonight by sharing a quote uh, from one of my favorite artists with you. And that quote really kind of embodies my philosophy of life. Okay. Okay? Yes, there we go. The way to know life is to love many things. That is a profound statement. And I think anybody who's been on this earth for any length of time will see the truth in that statement. The more you learn about this wonderful world and the universe that it is in, the more awe and wondrous it all seems to you. And there never seems to be uh, an end to things that we can learn and appreciate the beauty out there. So this is my life's philosophy. Now, some of you are wondering, who's this Mark Swain guy? Uh, most of you have never heard of me before, so let me tell you a funny little story. My first job out of the university was working for AT&T, and our, our department designed and sold voice and data networks. And one day, I'm sitting in my office, and this guy knocks on the door, and he says, uh, Hi, uh, I'm so-and-so. Uh, Fred Hinkley, actually, was his name. He says, uh, Can I interview you? Uh, I says, uh, Interview me? I says, uh, why would anybody want to interview me? And he says, well, uh, I've been tasked by the newspaper to go and find the most interesting employee who works at AT&T and interview them and write an article on them. And I walked in your building and I started randomly asking everybody around on all the floors, who's the most interesting person who works here? And every single one of them gave me your name. <laughs> now, I had no idea that my colleagues felt that way about me. I was, I was, I was very much humbled by that. Uh, but he went ahead and, and wrote an article about me, and uh, then I was even more humbled, because here's the article. He called me a renaissance man. I had to go look up the term. I didn't even know what a renaissance man was. <laughs> the truth of the matter is, my friends, ever since I was... The youngest I can remember, I've been fascinated with this world and everything in it. People say, well, what are you interested in? My answer was everything. Everything fascinated. How many of you are like that? See, I think that that's actually our common heritage as human beings. But that's, we're not taught, we're not taught to actually encourage that and build it. Um, but I do in my business, which I'll talk about a little bit later. So, um, let me show you a few of my interests. I started interpreting the world visually when I was a very young boy. I started drawing, and uh, then I noticed that even at a young age, people started buying my drawings. Well, I wanted to be a marine biologist, so I didn't take any classes on art in high school. And when I was a senior, I thought, you know what, I've never had an art class, I'm gonna take an art class. So I took an art class and was offered a college scholarship after one art class. And I thought, whoa, that's uh, interesting. 
And by the way, I did I graduated in art. I went through three majors at the university <laughs> and two careers before I found my life's work. So there's hope for all of you out there who don't know what you want to be when you grow up. Another one of my lifelong uh, interests is mineralogy. Um, I used to walk to school, the elementary school, past this rock collector's house. And he had a beautiful rock garden full of petrified wood and geodes. And every day on the way to and from, on the way home from school, I would slow by his yard and admire his beautiful rocks. And one day he caught me. Admiring his rocks. And he came walking over and he says, Do you like these rocks, son? I says, What a beautiful rock you are, sir. He says, Why don't you wait there for a second? He came walking back with this very rock, a piece of wonderstone from the Vernon Hills in Tooele County. And he says, Why don't you take this and start your own rock collection? I ran all the way home to show my mom. That single act of kindness started my lifelong love affair with the mineral kingdom. I become an avid field collector. I collected in many states. I have specimens in my collection from every continent on earth, all over the world. I specialize in thumbnails. You can see this bottom here. They fit in an inch and a quarter square box. I have over 4,000 of those curated in my collection from all over the world. In fact, here are some. And you're welcome to come look at them after. I uh, pulled together a few. These are all from Utah. These uh, thumbnails here are all from the state of Utah. So you can feel free to come and look at these after if you would like to do so. I've had the opportunity to collect uh, most of the mining districts here in Utah. I've been thousands of feet underground. They've pretty much closed all the mines now. Uh, but I got into microphotography. Uh, I just, uh, it became a lifelong passion. All because of a single act of kindness. One human being to another. I want you to think about that. The fact that the, the, the fact that could have on a young person's life. Another one of my interests is music. I begged my parents for a piano when I turned seven years old and I practiced it faithfully for the next seven years. I was learning Rachmaninoff's piano concerto number two Opus 18, all 100 pages of it, 15, when I walked away from piano lessons because I wanted to do other things with my life. My piano teacher lamented to my mother and said, Mark has the ability to become a world-class concert pianist. I am so saddened that he is walking away from this. But my friends, that's not what Mark Swain wanted to do with his life. Other things were calling to me. Uh, by the way, I continue to play the piano over the years. I play my programs all the time, my piano, my guitar, my synthesizer. Uh, I'm, I'm finishing up a, what I call the most beautiful song I've ever written right now, a composition. I hope to have it out very quick. My favorite uh, show when I was a young boy was The Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau. Can any of you buddy remember The Undersea World of Jacques Cousteau? I dreamed of being a crew uh, member on the Calypso. And then going all over the world of the coral reefs. And when I turned 16, I noticed that there was an ad for uh, workers to go to Hawaii and pick pineapples for Gold Pineapple Company on the island of Molokai. Well, I had worked for a, 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 a farmer every summer for years. And so I threw my uh, name in the hat and I was chosen to go to Hawaii. Every opportunity I got, I went down to the reef and snorkeled the reef and collected seashells and fell in love with the underwater world. In fact, that was the catalyst that made me want to become a marine biologist, which obviously I, I didn't. That's another story. Another one of my lifelong interests is building high performance motorcycles and cars. I've souped up every vehicle I've ever had, including the ones out in the parking lot. I just love to build motors. Uh, I built them for other people. In fact, uh, the street rod up in the corner, I used to help this guy build his uh, small block Chevrolets for his uh, uh, hot rods and tune them. Uh, and unfortunately, he passed away with COVID. And uh, that's sad. You know, uh, never get to see him again, but I got some great memories. Well, here's what I do for a living. For the last 30 years, I've been a professional speaker, workshop facilitator, and a personal life coach. Uh, I've spoken all over the world. Uh, I've taught uh, over 30 different subjects, everything from 
teaching government contractors how to write winning pr pr proposals for the federal government, to creativity and innovation, to interpersonal communication skill. Everything fascinates me. I've worked for Franklin Covey, Day Primer, Lee Heck Harris, and a lot of other companies. I have two passions in life. I figured, finally figured this out in my 50s. I love to learn, and I love to share what I learn with other people. And that's why my life's work finally found me when, when I was in my 40s. Well, I've been asked to talk about another one of my lifelong passions this evening with you, and that is astronomy. And how did this all start for Mark Swain? Well, there were two things that happened. The first was a very special birthday gift from my parents when I turned 12. This little department store task the reflector. The first time I focused it on the moon, I was blown away. I could actually see the craters and the maria and the mountains. And I explored every square inch of that moon. I couldn't believe that from my backyard, I could look at another world. Well, uh, I used this little scope a lot, but I did have one disappointment that I have to admit. Um, the stuff I was looking at in the sky never quite looked like the pictures on the box. <laughs> the Crab Nebula, the Cone Nebula. I was having a real hard time finding those things with this little thing here. So. <laughs> the second event that happened was that my scoutmaster took us on an overnight camping trip above the city where I live, Bountiful, Utah. And uh, we were right. We were right in this grove of trees. We hiked down from Skyline Drive over here along the ridge, and we camped right in this little grove of trees here. And we were all sitting around the fire telling stories, and the embers were kind of ebbing. And then our scoutmaster said, is there anybody who would like to learn about the night sky? And most people begged off and went to bed, but me and two other guys said we'd love to do that. So my scoutmaster and the two of us, we, three of us, excuse me, walked over to this little meadow here. And he pulled out, Any of you remember what these are called? Planisphere. It's a planisphere. How many of you still own one of these or a number of them? <laughs> I figured it's fun. He pulled out this cool little thing in a red flashlight and he started lining it up and then he started pointing out the major constellations. I was so impressed. My scoutmaster actually was a brilliant man and it's one of the blessings of my life that he crossed my path. We sat out there for about an hour and he showed us all the beautiful things in the sky. Well, I was hooked now. I was hooked for life. And so my next visit was to the local library. And I have to admit to you guys, I started checking out astronomy books, and, and many of them were way up here. They were so complex, I couldn't begin to understand it. But I checked them out anyway. And I would read through them and think, gee, it sure would be neat to be able to understand this math. Someday I'm going to learn how to do this math so that I can understand these beautiful things because I'm sure that they describe some wondrous things in the universe. Well, one day I was going through the library and I went to the, to the magazine rack and I came across a magazine called Sky and Telescope. Does that ring any bells? To you? Yeah. <laughs> well, all these books I've been checking out talk about if you really want to get into astronomy, you need a serious telescope. And their definition of a serious telescope was an equatorial mounted Newtonian reflector, right? So I'm sitting there going through the pages of Sky and Telescope, and lo and behold, this appears. Does anybody remember the RV6 dinoscope? I have. It, did anybody have one? I have. I still have one. You still have your RV6? Oh, my Oh my gosh. I saw this thing and I thought, that's a serious telescope. And you know what? I can afford that. I had been working for a farmer and saving my money. So I bought that. I started to learn how to navigate the night sky because this little thing had setting circles on it. And I could polar align it and actually dial in things I wanted to look at. Well, I would set it up in my front yard and all of a sudden, all my neighbors started showing up. There's nobody else had a telescope. They said, what are you doing, Mark? And I'd say, hey, you want to see the star cluster? You want to see Jupiter or Saturn? And once in a while, you know, a whole bunch of people would come. And of course, I was reading up on this stuff, and they said, you like to put a presentation together. And so I put a presentation together, and I started giving it to groups. And one day, I was invited to give my presentation up at the University of Utah to a group of students. 
I want to talk about the firsts. Let's back up here a second. These are the first things that I can remember looking at through my RV6. My first planet was Jupiter. Who remembers looking at Jupiter for the very first time for your telescope? Weren't you blown away when you could actually see the color in the equatorial uh, belts, those two the prominent belts? And you could see all the Galilean satellites all lined up, Ganymede, Europa, Callisto, and I know, and changing positions every night. I thought that was the coolest thing in the world. I was looking at this faraway planet, much bigger than the Earth. My first double star, would anybody like to guess what it was? <laughs> It was Alberio, and to this day, Alberio is still my very favorite uh, star, double star. In fact, one of the first things you learn when you get a telescope is that stars come in other colors other than white. It's really weird when you start actually seeing the colors of the stars, and this remains the jewel of the heavens to me in terms of the best double star in the sky. My first star cluster was M13. I will never forget racking M13 into focus. And all of a sudden, it looked like somebody had taken a handful of diamonds and thrown them on a field of black velvet. I couldn't believe that something so cool was up in the sky. And then I learned a little bit about M13. 25,000 light years away. I, I figured out I was looking at light that left that object 25,000 years ago my telescope would become a time machine. I was seeing things as they were, not as they are. I learned that this star cluster has 200,000 stars in a diameter of about 145 light years. I still love this. And I've seen Omega Centauri from southern latitudes, which is gorgeous, but M13 will always have a very special place in my heart. My first uh, nebula, a mission nebula, was M8, new nebula. 5,000 light years uh, distant, about 110 by 51 light years uh, in dimension. And when I first uh, focused on this, I could see the gas clouds. I could actually see interstellar glass, gas clouds through my RV6. It blew my mind that I could actually see that in my telescope. And then when I realized I was looking at a stellar nursery, new stars were being born. You can see all the Bach globules in there and the protostar material is coalescing into new stars. How cool to be looking at creation itself. My first planetary nebula was M57. Uh, how many of you remember looking at a little smoke ring for the first time? I never get tired of it, although it humbles me a little bit because I realize that that is the life course that our sun will someday take. When it gets towards the end of its life, it will shed its outer layers of atmosphere and become a planetary nebula such as this, end up its existence as a white dwarf star. My first galaxy was M81, or a Boda's galaxy, uh, 12 million light years distant, 90,000 light years in diameter, containing about uh, 250 billion stars. This was a spiritual experience for me. I looked at that faint little patch, 12 million light years away, and I thought, I wonder if there's somebody living on a planet orbiting one of those stars that's in his or her backyard right now with a telescope, looking at my faraway galaxy, the Milky Way. It was a very, very, special experience for me when I saw that. One day I went to an open house up at the University of Utah. Uh, the North Physics Building uh, has an observatory on top. And there was this really nice gentleman named Lowell Lyons. He was operating the 16-inch telescope that night. And when I started asking him questions, he could see that I was interested in his price. He says, you know Mark? He says, you ought to come join the Salt Lake Astronomical Society. And then you can hang out with people like you that enjoy the stars, and I thought that that was the coolest idea ever. So I joined, and we met at the old Hanson Planetarium there on, on State Street, and I made all kinds of new friends at the Salt Lake Astronomical Society. 
One of the things that happened when I joined the Astronomical Society is that our club got a discounted rate on both astronomy and sky and telescope magazine. You guys have a thing like that with the Utah Valley Astronomy Club where you get a discounted rate for your club? So I had subscribed to both of them. And one day I saw this ad here. Now I had known Mead as the company that made high quality equatorial mounted uh, Newtonian reflectors. And I had never seen that they were making Schmidt cast strains. In fact, while this happened, I was actually in conversation with Patrick Wiggins. Any of you know Patrick? Uh, the old Hanson Planetarium. He was trying to get me to buy a Celestron C8. Nothing against Celestron. I've owned a number of them at that one of my observatory. But when I compared the construction of the field tripod here on the Me 2080 with the flimsy one on the C8 uh, and the more modern design here, I thought, you know what, I'm going to take a chance. And so I went with the Me. And I've never, I've never been disappointed in that. That was a very, very good telescope. Now, I want to tell you about a very special star party. Let's go back up to the University of Utah. I was invited to go up there and speak. And I had a big group of people like this, and I was given a slideshow. And afterwards, I was going to set my telescope up. Well, there was this one student in the audience, and she kept asking me all these really cool questions about astronomy. And I was impressed. And when I went out and set my telescope at, at her, everybody kind of peeled off after a while, and I noticed that it was just her and I, and she was still asking me questions. And I thought, well, she really likes astronomy, but I, I think she actually likes me, too. <laughs> and I was kind of uh, enamored with her, so I got a phone number, and uh, there's my wife right there, and that's uh, who I am married. So it's very interesting how we meet. It's always fun to listen to people's stories of how they meet. Anyway, she's been my stargazing partner ever since, and we've had some incredible adventures. Here's the actual flyer from that star party that night. <laughs> Sometimes you don't think they're going to be very special, but when you look back decades later, they can become very, very special and have a lot of sentimental value to you. Uh, the Salt Lake Astronomical Society, we did a lot of really cool star parties. And one of the things we did back in that time is we used to partner with other astronomical uh, clubs. And this is a star party that we held conjointly at Dinosaur National Park with the Denver Astronomical Society. That was such a fun evening. There were all kinds of people. And they had all kinds of telescopes. And it was just so fun walking around and looking at uh, the same objects through different kinds of telescopes. In fact, you all know that that's one of the real joys of going to a star party is that you can kind of get that comparison going. Okay, I want to talk about some of my favorite books early on. The first one, that some of you guys might have some of these in your library. Um, how many of you remember uh, Patrick Moore, the great British astronomer? He, he wrote in such a wonderful conversational style that he introduced so many people. He was kind of like the Bob Ross of astronomy, you know? <laughs> he, had, he, he had introduced people to this wonderful hobby. This little book, The A uh, to Z of Astronomy, just had all kinds of interesting facts about the universe in it, and I read it over and over and over again. Another one of my early favorites was all about telescopes. Now, I'm in my 60s now, and I'm going to tell you something that I believe strongly. If all math books were written like this, visually, we would have a whole lot more mathematicians in this world. I could understand everything that Mr. Brown was saying in here because he laid it out so clearly, uh, visually. And so I fell in love with this little book. Uh, it's, it still remain, uh, remains one of the, my very favorite books that I ever purchased on astronomy. Uh, my, my Encyclopedia of Astronomy. How many of you have a set of Burning Celestial Handbook? This is actually my traveling copy. I have a, a, I have a copy of uh, the hardbacks to a home, but these were the original ones I bought. Robert Burnham worked at uh, uh, Lowell Observatory in Arizona, and he literally takes a constellation by constellation, talks history, mythology, uh, stars, uh, you know, quasars, galaxies, the whole nine yards, and this was just such an incredible read. Some people curl up with novels, 
and others of us curl up with Burnham Celestial Handbook, right? In fact, <laughs> Professor Jett was showing me his copy. He says, I, want, I wonder if mine are older than yours, and his are older than mine. About him used. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't have to tell him. <laughs> Let him be impressed. Oh, this, this little book here was a real treasure. The Messier album. This astronomer in Prescott, Arizona had a 12 and a half inch cave Newtonian reflector equilibrium mounted. And he built his own uh, guiding head and cold camera. Now I want you to get an appreciation for this. This little metal holder here uh, is for dry ice. And he would cut single frames of triax pan black and white film and stick them in there and take photographs of the Messier objects. Now, these don't look real impressive by modern standards, but back then, I looked through this book and I thought, oh my gosh, how beautiful. Someday I would like to take pictures of the Messier objects as well. This again remains one of those touchstones that guided me on my journey of astronomy. Norton Star Atlas. How many of you have Norton Star Atlas? This was my first Star Atlas, and what I really loved about this is that each constellation uh, was laid out like this on a two-page spread. I took my little red pen and I actually drew in all the constellations. And uh, each constellation had a list of stars and then it had a list of deep space objects. This was at my telescope uh, out in the field for years and years and years. And then I got a copy Wow, this is a serious star atlas here. It's Produced a collector's item now. What's that? It's a collector's item now. It's a collector's item now. Uh, atlas of the Heavens, uh, Atlas Coli by uh, Antonin Bekvar. And uh, you have a copy as well, Richard. We were talking about this uh, before. Now everybody can have a, an atlas on their telephone, which is pretty cool. And the pages are always wavy. <laughs> well, that's true. I met a guy in the Salt Lake Astronomical Society who I found out lived in Bound to where I live. And one night at the meeting we were talking, he says, Mark, my dad and I built an observatory in my backyard. Would you like to come see it? And I thought, an observatory in your own backyard? How cool is that? So we go over there, and Scott takes me up in the dome. My wife and I are there. And I was in awe all night long. And as we left there, I tucked this away in the back of my mind. Someday I'm going to have an observatory in my backyard too. My early adventures with astrophotography. How many of you do astrophotography? You're probably a lot better than me, most of you. These were actually the very first pictures that I took with um, through my mean 28 Schmidt Cassegrain. Uh, they're not real great, as you can see, but they were my very first efforts. Uh, these were taken on ectochrome film, uh, those of you that remember that back from uh, way back in the day. Uh, remember that little star party I showed you at Dinosaur National Park? Well, that night was the first time I ever mounted my, um, uh, my 35 millimeter camera on top of my Schmidt gas crane, and I took this time exposure using a gas hyper Fujichrome 400 film. And uh, I entered it in the Salt Lake Astronomical Society in annual photography contest, and I won the first place. And I thought that was pretty cool for a rookie. Uh, Konica came out with a 3200 ASA film in 1988, and this is probably one of the most enjoyable nights I've ever spent under the stars. My wife and I headed up to the windows, and we took off on a dirt road I'd never been on before, and it went up to the top of the mountain, we came around this curve. There was a place to pull off, and the road dropped off to the south and it showed the whole expanse of the heavens. I set up my Schmidt pass screen, put my camera on top, attached the cable release, and I spent the whole night with that 3200 ASA film. Now, again, this isn't very impressive by 2022 standards, but remember how long ago this was. And those are, those are just single exposures. Those aren't, those aren't stacked exposures like we do now with Deep Sky Stacker. These are all you know, single exposures. Astrophotography kind of took uh, it kind of took a hiatus for me in the 1990s. I got busy traveling the world with my business, and I just didn't have a lot of time for astrophotography. But I did step outside my front door and take a picture, a snapshot of Hale-Bopp uh, when it uh, came into the sky. 
And you guys remember how bright that was? You can sit there and actually look at it with your naked eye. It was so bright. That was such an incredible sight to, to see. Well, combining business with pleasure. As I told you, um, I've taught workshops for years. I go in and teach workshops for company retreats and so forth. One day I noticed that the speaker they were having after me wasn't talking on a business topic. They were talking on something fun. I can't remember what it was, but I thought, companies will pay for something fun? <laughs> and so I decided, hey, they're going to be here overnight. A lot of times they go to these places and stay overnight. So I started pitching a star party. I'll do a slide presentation. I'll set up my telescopes. And I'll show you guys the nice guy. Well, I got papers on that. And this is the actual flyer I used back in the very early 90s to market that uh, service to uh, corporations. OK. How much did you charge? What I did, that's a really good question. It's fair. I actually, what I did is I, I sweetened the pot by including that. If they bought the business presentation, I'd go ahead and throw that in for free. So don't try competing with Mark Swain if you go out of the market. <laughs> I like to give things away for free. How many of you have ever been to a major observatory before? I decided early on that I wanted to go visit some of the, I call them temples of astronomy. The first one I went to, uh, I was out in Santa Clara, California, training with at and And we had to stay over the weekend, and so I talked to a couple of guys in my class, and I said, hey, how many of you would like to drive down to Mount Hamilton with me and see the observatory? And I got a couple guys in my class. They were all technical people. We piled in there and went to the observatory on Mount Hamilton, and that was really a cool thing to see the 120-inch uh, uh, reflector and the 36-inch refractor as well. Uh, in 2005, my wife and I went scuba diving down in the Yucatan, and we decided to take a little jaunt over to Chichen Itza to El Caracol, uh, that means snail in Spanish, because it has a spiral staircase inside of it. But that, it was the Mayan Observatory built at Chichen Itza in 906 AD. So that was a pretty cool thing to see. Oh, Mount Palomar. This was a spiritual experience. I've been there a number of times. The pictures here were taken in 2008 when I went there with my family, but I've been there earlier. And I will never forget coming up over the rise and seeing that 200-inch dome, and then going over to see the dome of the 48-inch Schmidt telescope and know that those two instruments working in tandem were responsible for so many of the major discoveries in astronomy that had taken place during my lifetime. It was a really cool experience. In 2011, my wife and then I uh, combined a trip to the Tucson Mineral Show with a trip to Kitt Peak National Observatory. Have any of you ever been to Kitt Peak? They do something really cool at Kitt Peak. They have a public outreach program, and in the evening, they provide a little box dinner, and then they give you a presentation in the visitor center, and then they take you on this great big deck outside of the visitor center, and they pass out 10 by 50 binoculars and planospheres, and they proceed to teach people the night sky. And so people are, well, you all have your own binoculars, and you're finding these objects, and then to top it off, about an hour later, they divided our group into six groups, and they sent each of us to one of the observatories on the top of Kitt Peak. We actually got to look through the big telescopes on Kitt Peak. Now, how cool is that for somebody who loves astronomy? Uh, just if you've never been down there before and done that, please put that on your list if you love astronomy. That is just a really cool thing to do. Where is it at? It's uh, south uh, southwest of Tucson. It says it's temporarily closed. Fire they just had a big fire. Okay. They just had a big fire there. In fact, uh, the guy and my friend in Tucson was telling me, I says, oh, it did do get the observatory. He says, got very close to the observatory. Mm -hmm. So, oh my heavens, like that's a world treasure. Well, in 1986, my wife and I went to uh, Hawaii to see Howley's Comet. And it was a very big disappointment. When we were on the big island, we had planned to go to the top of Mauna Kea and we got rained out, so we didn't get to go. So in 2016, when we went back to the Big Island, I says, I'm going to the top of Mauna Kea. How many of you have been to the top of Mauna Kea? Okay, so you'll know what happens when you get to Mauna Kea, you get up to 9,200 feet, and there's this visitor center, and they say, please take a half hour to acclimate to this, this elevation here, okay? And so I'm kicking around, waiting my half hour, and I run into this site. 
This is how they store their telescopes for their nightly star parties. I almost had cardiac arrest when I saw that. Now, I don't know how fastidious you are with your optics, but that, that caused major problems in my head when I saw those nice telescopes being stored like that. Well, anyway, after a half hour, my wife and I pile in our Jeep, and we head up this steep road, and it is steep. Uh, but the vistas are breathtaking. At about 10,500 feet, we look back, and we can see the visitor center down there. And then over here, you can see Mauna Loa, the great uh, shield volcano on the southern uh, uh, part of the island of Hawaii, pe uh, peeking up above the cloud deck. Well, we noticed that as we got closer to the observatories at the top, they had paved the road. And why did they do that? No dust. To keep the dust down on those huge, uh, expensive instruments, okay? So up around the bend, and boy, it's getting really steep now, and then I see this. I was just almost overwhelmed. Some of the most uh, wonderful instruments on planet Earth right there in front of me. Uh, Caltech, uh, see, the James Kirk Maxwell Telescope, Caltech Telescope, the big uh, square uh, dome of the Subaru Telescope, and then the twin domes of the Keck Telescope. And uh, then when I got to the top, I was so fortunate that it was clear that day. And I was able to get these panoramic pictures. Uh, at the top is the uh, NASA Infrared Telescope, the Canada France Hawaii Telescope, the Gemini North Telescope, University of Hawaii. See that little tiny dome on the end? That was the original observatory they built up there to test if that was a good location. It had an 18 inch reflector in it. <laughs> and they still have that little dome up there. How cool is that, right? Well, unfortunately, when I hopped out of the car to take pictures, I went where my wife was, and she was kind of doubled over, and uh, she had a, a horrible case of altitude sickness. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was actually kind of terrified, because she was not in good shape at all. So I snapped these pictures, and then I hopped in the car, and I hightailed as fast as I could down that road to get her down out of that altitude, uh, because it, it, it can be very dangerous, uh, you know, altitude sickness. It's the only place I know where you can go from sea level to 14,000 feet in about 35 miles. That's correct. And that's, that's one heck of a, an elevation change. I mean, how many of you, have any of you ever, like, uh, what's, the, what's the highest peak in uh, Utah? King's Peak. Does anybody ever climb King's Peak? I did. And it was, it was a grueling process, uh, you know, climbing that last, and it's not even 14,000 feet high. This is over 14,000 feet high, and we started that day, as Professor Jensen said, at sea level. So you better, you know, be nice to your body because everybody's body doesn't acclimate the same way. Well, I mentioned that years before this, I had planted a dream that someday I'd have my own observatory. And so in 2005, I decided to make that dream come true, and I designed and started building Pleasant Valley Observatory. First light, August 2006. Uh, Where's my young people here? <laughs> don't ever think don't ever think a dream is too big for you. Looking back on my life, I can tell you that dreams come true. If you believe them. But you have to believe them. So if there's anything in your life you really want, go for it. It is within your reach if you really believe it. I had been a guest instructor at the University of Utah at the College of Health, and I had just finished delivering a class for the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute. I did a class on uh, Sir David Brewster, the inventor of the kaleidoscope, and I called the class uh, Kaleidoscopes, the Science and the Art. And I described uh, all that science behind a kaleidoscope, and then for our final project, I helped each of the participants build their own kaleidoscope to take home. Well, the class was very well received, and they knew that I had a love of astronomy, and they said, we want to make a proposal to you. Would you create a semester-long course on astronomy for a lay person and take us to the very edge of the known universe? And so I did the marvels and mysteries of our universe. In that semester-long course I taught at Osher Life my Learning Institute at the University of Utah. It was packed, it was very well received. And for our final class, I hosted a star party at Red Butte Gardens in Arboretum. 
and I showed the participants some of the many objects that we had talked about uh, during our semester on class. They invited me to come back and teach again, but I was traveling and my business just didn't permit uh, me to do that again. But it was a very fun experience of teaching at the university. In 2015, I replaced the great big thousand pound dome on my observatory with a lighter commercial unit. One of the things that humbles you as you get older, young people, is that you find out that your mind still thinks it's 25, and your body goes, uh, no. And it was getting harder and harder to turn my 1,000-pound dome, and so I bought this uh, Explorer dome and uh, retrofitted the 12-foot dome with an 8-foot dome. I can turn that dome with one finger. I have absolutely loved it. Here's the inside. Um, I picked up a second-hand uh, Mead LX200, uh, and uh, I, on top of it, it's writing my Celestron 80 millimeter refractor, which is also just a wonderful top telescope optically. My continuing adventures. How many of you went to see the, the eclipse in 2017 someplace where you could see it? That is fantastic. We cruised up to the middle of nowhere in northern Wyoming, so we would be right in the middle of the path of locality. And I pulled off the road, there was not a soul there, and all of a sudden, cars start, saw my tent, and they started pulling off the road. But by the end of the day, we had an international party going on. I had the Germans next to me, I had the Australians on the other side of the day. It was, we literally had a party. It was absolutely wonderful. I will never forget the minute the moon blacked out the sun. Everything disappeared for a second. <clears throat> if you can remember what that was like, it's like, where did everything go? And then it's all, boom, the corona comes out. And I was just, I was awestruck. The dancing tendrils of light, I will never forget how beautiful that was. And I'm going to be forever thankful that we took the opportunity to go see that when we had an opportunity to do it. Now, there's one coming up, I believe, next year or the year after. And uh, you'll be able to see it in Texas, I think, isn't it? If you haven't seen a, a, a full solar, solar eclipse, do yourself a favor and do what you can to get to a place where you can see that. Two of my favorite observing sites. People always ask me, where do you like to go look at the stars? The top picture is on the way to Dead Horse Point uh, down by Moab. Great big, huge section of flat uh, rock there. Big, wide horizon. The bottom is uh, near Hanksville. And they have incredibly dark skies there. It's just a joy to sit there, whether you're doing it visually or engaging in astrophotography. It's just, it's worth, you know, carting your gear out to sites like that. Another one of my favorite places that's closer is Wolf Creek. How many of you have been up to Wolf Creek? Um, Lowell Lyon, the guy that invited me to be at SLAS, the guy that was operating the telescope on top of the University of Utah, clear back in the 70s, we've remained friends. And he contacted me and says, Mark, I'm getting a group together. How would you like to go up to Wolf Creek? Uh, he says, we're going to take our dogs. And I says, well, I don't want to take my dog. I want to do some astrophotography, but I'd love to go. So we all went up there, and they had the dogs. And uh, once everybody was to bed, I started taking pictures. Because until then, all the laser pointers were going around. And that's cool. That's what everybody's up there for, right? I took this picture of the Milky Way. It's a single exposure, three minutes on the back of my uh, telescope. Um, I was very happy with it, uh, but when I showed it to a couple of people, they said, actually, Mark, that is a really good picture. So I entered it in the fair and won a first place ribbon. And then uh, Patrick uh, Wiggins of the Astronomical Society asked me if he could use that for the cover of our newsletter. I was really honored. Uh, uh, Patrick's another friend I've had for years. Uh, meet some really good people when you hang around uh, the astronomy group. This is probably the most significant thing that ever happened in Pleasant Valley Observatory. The young man there, Zach, he approached me one day. He seen my observatory in the backyard, and he came over and he says, Mark, this might sound kind of weird, but can I use your observatory to propose to my he said she's studying physics at the university and she wants to be an astronomer. And she loves to look at the stars. And uh, they came over that night and we put a little plan together. I said, um, I'm gonna show you my favorite, most beautiful star and that will be your cue. So I queued up Alberio and I said, this is the most beautiful star in the heavens. And they both looked and then he turned to his sweetheart. 
And he said, you know, Cassandra, he says, you're my most beautiful star. Would you marry me? I got to share that special moment, so did Christy, with those young people. I don't know if there will ever be an event again like that, because of how he's hurt for it. But I'm very happy that I was honored to be there that night. How many of you took some pictures of Neo Wise? Uh, these were taken at the elementary school up the street from me. I just got on my tripod, put my camera on there, nothing special there, but um, I'm glad that I took the opportunity to try to get some pictures. Here I am getting ready to host a star party. Uh, I host them all the time. In fact, I'm hosting a group tomorrow night at my observatory. Um, people are always wanting to come over, and I never turn down a group. And so um, the picture over here is I'm, I'm collimating my Dobsonian with a Hotec laser collimator. This is a group that I had in 2021. And uh, for that, uh, Jupiter was very well placed in the sky that night, so I hooked my uh, smartphone up to my Schmidt Cassegrain, and I let them all snap a picture of Jupiter to take away as a memento of their visit to Pleasant Valley Observatory. And that is actually one of the participants' photos. Just a single, this is not a stack. This is just a one push the button to take a picture of Jupiter. That's a pretty good picture, wouldn't you say? Uh, here are some photos I took in 2021, and mind you, I'm just getting back into astrophotography. My focus over all these years has basically been visual astronomy, but now I'm at the point where I'd like to get uh, back into uh, astrophotography. In fact, uh, the, the, all the rage now is seeing how many photons you can capture, right? You know, hours and hours and hours. I'm going the other way. I'm experimenting with how short of exposures can I use and actually get a decent image of some of those things in the sky. So I did these uh, just a little while back. These were all of my 80 millimeter refractors, my Celestron. Uh, so you got the double cluster. These are all 30 second exposures, uh, M16 Eagle Nebula, uh, M81 and M82, the galaxies there, uh, M27, the Dumbbell Nebula, M57, M31, the Andromeda <coughs> Galaxy, Alberio, M13, and then M11, uh, the Wild Duck Cluster. People ask me all the time, Mark, do you ever get afraid of being out in a star all by yourself all the time? And I stay up all night, all the time, literally all night. When I go in my observatory and close that door and open the shutter on my dome, I feel it's almost like an altered state of consciousness. It's just me and my dear friend. And after the city finally goes to sleep in the early morning hours, I basically luxuriate in the quiet darkness. I love these words by Sarah Williams. In fact, Rachel, mm -hmm. Rachel made this for me to hang in my observatory. I have loved the stars too fondly to be fearful of the night. Beautiful. Have you ever seen anything strange in the sky when you were stargazing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, actually we have. I've seen a lot of things. Probably one of the most remarkable is one night we were up in the wind as a soapstone and I was doing a star party. And I had just uh, shown everybody Saturn and I was getting ready to turn the telescope to M13. And everybody was off and they said, hey, well, what's that, what's that? And I wasn't paying any attention because I was moving my telescope. Finally one of them said, Mark, what, what, what's that? And I looked up and then somebody says, well, what's that one there? Well, there's another one over there. Well, it turns out there are five objects in the sky and they are converging on a common point. They look like satellites. They're going at the exact same velocity and they're going towards a common point. So obviously what we do is we all just shut up when we're watching this because we wonder what's gonna happen when they hit that point. They all got there at the, what were there, five? I think there were five objects. They all got there at the exact time, and poof, they're gone. Now, everybody stood there just in silence for about five seconds and then one of the people spoke and says, uh, Mark? What was that? I said, that's why there's a term unidentified. My God. Congratulations. You know, I just see something you can't explain, right? I don't know what it was, but it sure was bizarro. Now, you guys already know I like to collect things. Here are some more of my collections. I'd like to talk about astronomy and collecting, because astronomy is very unique for collectors. 
It is one thing that you can collect that nobody else can ever take away and hide away and keep away from everybody else. The night sky is forever there for all humanity to enjoy. Nobody can own it, nobody can take it away. Everybody has access to the night sky. And that's why I love it so much. Lessons learned along the way. Here's your chance to listen to a 66-year-old guy tell you what he's learned. Enjoy the night sky. You can get a blanket, lay out on your back, and just enjoy looking. If you want to spend $30, you can get a 10 by 50 set of binoculars. Get yourself a planisphere or a free app for your phone, and you can spend night after night after night looking at things with a pair of binoculars. You can see many of the Messier objects really well with a pair of binoculars. Okay, you don't need to spend a lot of money. You don't have to have the latest technology. My observatory, both telescopes are nearly 20 years old. Stellarium in there that runs all my telescopes is running on a Windows 7 laptop. <laughs> you don't have to always be spending a lot of money on the latest, greatest. You just get what works for you. Don't get caught up in having to have the latest, greatest. Don't raise your hands. How many of you have ever bought technology because you wanted the latest, greatest, and never even took the time to learn all of its capabilities before you were on to buying something else? <laughs> it's a trap. Bigger isn't necessarily better. I want to underscore this. The best telescope is the one that you'll use. I don't get my big dog out very often. Uh, I get it out more now than I used to because I build a trolley for it. But it's pretty hard to schlep around to a dark sky site. But my little HEQ5 Pro Equatorial Mount, my 80 millimeter refractor, that's not hard at all to schlep to a dark sky site to do astrophotography with. So don't get aperture fever and buy something that you can't even lift. Okay? I know a guy that just bought an old bead uh, 10 inch Schmidt cast grain and he's having a hard time even getting it up on the field tripod. Okay? I'm not trying to make fun of anybody. But just, you know, be realistic when you purchase your equipment. Have the patience with yourself, okay? There's much to learn. Professor Jensen can tell you that, you know, he spent his lifetime studying astronomy, and I'm sure that he feels like there's still much to learn. There, it's a, it's a never-ending frontier. So be, be patient with yourself. You know, allow yourself to enjoy the journey. Don't always worry about getting there. Enjoy the process. Enjoy the hobby on your terms. How many of you in here would say you enjoy visual astronomy more than astrophotography? Okay. How many enjoy astrophotography more? Okay, who's right? <laughs> You're all right. Because it's, it's a personal thing. It's however you want to approach the hobby. And how deep you want to go and how broad you want to go, that's all up to you. There aren't any rules. It's just what brings you joy. And that's the way you want to approach everything in life. Join your local club, Utah Valley Astronomy Club, okay? Um, hang out with people who love what you love. It, uh, you know, it doubles the pleasure. Now, about three or four years ago, I was out on my motorcycle taking a ride, and I happened to drive up the street where Scott Crosby, Crosby lived with his old backyard observatory. I noticed he was out in the driveway. He was actually working on his side-by-side. -side. And uh, my first inclination was to stop, and I thought, nah, he's busy, and I'm busy, I need to get home. The further I got up the street, I felt this overwhelming desire to go back and talk to Scott. So I turned my bike around, and I went back there and pulled in. I kind of felt embarrassed, and I was bugging him. He was so happy to see me. And we sat there and we talked, we reminisced, we ended up out in his observatory, we're sitting there laughing and talking about old times. I had one of the most beautiful mornings I can remember. <coughs> about three months later, I heard that he passed. I'm so thankful I turned my motorcycle around that day and went back to talk to my friend. In AD 79, August 24th. The citizens of the Roman resort town Pompeii just sat down to their midday meal. And while they were eating, Mount Vesuvius violently erupted. 
and rained down pumice and ash so fast and furious on this little town, and then unleashed a pyroclastic flow of uh, superheated poisonous gas. Thousands of people lost their lives. Now, how many of those people you think woke up on August 24th, AD 79, thinking this is going to be my last day on Earth? But it was. When they unearthed Pompeii, removed the 27 meters of ash in modern times, they found this engraved on the wall of a public building. Enjoy life while you have it. For tomorrow, it's uncertain. That is great advice to all of us, my friends. We, we go about our lives like we have a lease on life, but we don't. Even if you're a young person, none of us knows how long we have here. Carpe diem, seize the day. Whatever your heart is calling you to do, do it. Don't put it off till tomorrow. Don't put it off. Listen, why am I telling you guys this? Because our hobby is special in a way. Because it has to be done after dark. How many nights, don't raise your hands, how many nights have you got really tired, you're ready to go to bed, and you go to pull down the drapes, and you see a perfectly clear sky? And you start thinking, oh man, I had to get out my telescope. There aren't, there aren't many nights like this. And then how many times do we do that? Oh, I got to get up and work, you know. And, but couldn't we have taken it out for an hour or two? Christy and I were talking the other day. We like to get philosophical with each other. And we were looking back over our life at some of the most memorable experiences we've enjoyed together. And you know what one of the common factors they all had? They took hassle to enjoy. We had to load up all of our camping gear to go camping and come home and clean it and put it all away. I had to pack up our motorcycle gear. I had to load up my telescopes and set them up and pull or line them. But if we hadn't taken the time to do that, we would never have experienced some of the most precious memories that I have in my life. Don't let hassle keep you from living your life. I started this presentation with a quote by Vincent Van Gogh. The way to know life is to love many things. I would like to close by showing you his most famous painting. The starry night. I love this painting because I think it portrays the sky as it really is. Dynamic, in motion, and profoundly beautiful. It's been a privilege to spend some time this evening talking with you about my love for the starry sky. Clear skies, everybody. <laughs>